Um, uh, I'm Jeff DeBelco, Director of the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Very fortunate to have John Barnett, who is a geographer at the University of Melbourne, in town coming to talk at the Wilson Center on a range of topics. And John, I want to ask you about um, climate change and impact on small island states, a topic that you've spent a lot of time researching and a lot of time going out to um, to some of those states and living in some of those states and trying to understand what climate change impact is going to be. We hear a lot about migration as an obvious and dramatic impact uh, potentially coming from that. As people try to sort through um, the kind of the smoke versus the fire on that issue, what should they be keeping in mind in terms of climate change, small island states, and migration? Um, I think that it's it's probably worth sorting through, I guess, what what people in the United States or Europe or Australia might be hearing about what's going on there as opposed to, I think, what, what the evidence is. And the evidence is really at the moment that nobody's moving because of, of climate change. There are certainly instances of environmental change where climate might be having a slight signal that are causing some communities to think about leaving. Carteret's is a good example. Um, there are environmental changes there, they may be because of climate change, but there are a whole other range of other factors going on too. For the most part, most people in the region are moving for the same reasons they've always moved, which is about access to better labour markets and jobs, access to healthcare and education. Um, and, and we don't really see any particular change in that movement because of, of climate change yet. It doesn't mean that there won't be problems in the future, it doesn't mean they're not highly vulnerable to climate change. Um, but, but what we're hearing in the media about, about you know, the world's first climate refugees in the Pacific is not particularly true. There's no great evidence for that. Um, I guess that's my, yeah. my sort of short response. So the, it, it strikes me that there, there must be a, a challenge in a way to separate out the motivations for moving because it seems that there, it's always this kind of combination of push and pull, right. uh, as well as just the process of trying to determine in the power of suggestion, are you a climate migrate? Oh, well, of course. Right. Um, and the interest in framing that. Can you talk about how, from the perspective of some of the different actors in small island states, they view this uh, as threat as well as opportunity? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it is, I think, you know, empirically it's very difficult to ask somebody if they're a climate migrant. Awareness of climate change is very high in the region, particularly in countries like Tavali, where there's always journalists going there. And, and so everybody knows about climate change, and if you ask, are you worried about climate change, and they'll say yes. And if you ask people who've moved from Tavali and say, you know, did you move because of climate change, they may well say yes, but of course there are all sorts of other reasons that, that went into that decision at that time. People are, people are largely moving for pull factors in, in the region. You know, access to services and education. They, it's not to say that climate change won't be an increasing push factor in the future for all sorts of reasons, but, but it's not yet. D different countries have slightly different views on this question, um, depending on their political leaders and depending on, on um, the context in which discussions about migration and climate change arise. And so we see countries in the past have said, you know, we, we think that, that, that we're going to have to move because of climate change, and that's, a, that's to raise awareness of the problem it's also perhaps to to capitalise on some of the benefits that migration offers in terms of remittances and, and building up those networks across countries, which are very positive for some countries in the region. Countries that have a lot of migrants living in Australia, New Zealand, the US, tend to have better standards of living because of remittance flows, which can be very significant. Um, but but if you if you look at what some countries like Tuvalu have been saying recently, if you look at the speech by the Prime Minister and at the, at the Poznan conference, if you look at what previous um, presidents of Kiribati have said, for example, they've said, well, you know, fundamentally, this is our place and this is where we want to stay. We don't want to leave. This is our home and, and we, we would like to be doing adaptation to enable us to live the lives that are important to us culturally in terms of our values and communities. And I think one of the dangers about talking about climate change migrants is we lose sight of that right of individuals to, to choose where they want to live and to choose the lives that they have and to choose to live the, the kind of lifestyles that they want in the places where they come from. We shouldn't assume uh, that they don't have those rights any less than we do. That's well, the problem. That sounds like some good reminders then as we hear now and I think hear more in the future about climate migration, small island states, some 
good suggestions that it's quite complex uh, to keep in mind when we do it. Well, thank you, John. We'll look forward to more from you on this topic in the future.